the president of Korea Institute of Health and Social Affairs, to recite his welcoming remarks. Welcome to the international seminar. I am uh, Tess Lee, the president of KIASA, the Korean Institute for Health and Social Affairs. Uh, the topic of today's seminar is demographic change after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we gather here today to discuss this topic at an opportune time, given the enormous impact of the coronavirus pandemic on both public health and the societies and economies of the world, and its uh, ripple effects that have penetrated the demographic uh, structure. Korea is undergoing a rapid demographic change due to a, a low birth rate, uh, birth rate and an aging of the population. Recently, Korea's uh, total fertility rate plunged below one child per woman. Uh, this is the lowest rate in the world, as you know. Moreover, marriage rates and migrant inflows have dwindled owing to pandemic, uh, making it likely that Domestic population trends take a turn for the worse. Korea has worked to address the demographic changes since 2006, when it first implemented the plan for an aging society and population. Efforts continue to the present day. Policies to increase the fertility rate are being worked out alongside measures to bolster economic participation by women, seniors, and foreign residents. The government is also pursuing policies to address the extinction crisis facing pro provincial regions, regions and secure a source of retirement income for the growing number of elderly and provide them with the care they need. Sharing and discussing changes to the population structure of various East Asia and European countries in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis may provide some useful clues as to how we might better deal with the changing population in Korea. Kiasa has for nearly 50 years studied a broad swath of social policy, including population policy, as a national research institution. Its earliest four year, the Korea National Institute for Family Planning was founded in 1970. This organization was later merged with the Korea Health Development Institute to form what eventually become Kiasa now. Uh, to better respond to the changes to Korean society and family and the population as a whole, uh, Kiasa uh, will continue to develop a Korean model for addressing demographic change that can develop the quality of life of Korean people. And we will work harder than ever to design optimal policies that capably address the rapid changes now affecting the population. It is my great honor to be entrusted with the chairmanship of this seminar. Uh, great thanks go to Professor Kim Do the session moderator. I also greatly appreciate the world-renowned scholars that have traveled from afar to share their knowledge with us. Uh, to, doc to Dr. Thomas Sobotka, uh, Professor Stuart Zittel Baston, mm. Mr. Pugo uh, Plasity Optra, Professor Tan Porin, 
and Professor Om Son Yong. You all have my sincere gratitude for making the journey to Korea. Additional thanks to professors Choi Seul Gi, Ge Bong Ho, and Kim Young Nong for their gracious participation. I should also extend my thanks to everyone that has attended this seminar. Your keen interest in Korea's population issues is sincerely appreciated. Finally, please allow me to thank the International Cooperation Group at Kiasa. A special thanks go to uh, Dr. Shin Yun Jung and her team, including Ms. Park Su Bin, uh, Ms. Jung Hee Sun, and Mr. Im Jae-man. I hope that today's seminar will serve as a venue for the discovery of new ideas uh, that can be used to respond to population change in Europe, East Asia, and Korea alike. I also expect that today's gathering will serve as an occasion for meaningful exchange and cooperation among the many speakers, participant, participants, and researchers. Before we begin today, I would like to ask all of you here to help us build out Kiasa's international network by serving as a cornerstone in our research of efforts. Going forward, we will work to design a bona fide action plan incorporating the opinions of various stakeholders. You all have my sincere gratitude. Thank you again. Well, thank you for the warm welcoming remarks. Now we'll take a short break to take a photo of the presenters with us here today, and we'll come back soon. Thank you. Now that we took our time to capture this moment, we'll begin the first session of the seminar. I would like to welcome Professor Tu Sub Kim, who will moderate the session throughout the event today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Park. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tu Sub Kim from Hanyang University. Uh, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to serve as a moderator this morning. And uh, once again, welcome you all to this seminar on global demographic change after COVID-19. I'm very happy to meet with all friends and colleagues in good health throughout the pandemic. Well, over the past three years, we have witnessed drastic changes in demographic landscape in most countries. And there has been much speculation about the impact that COVID-19 has had on population changes across the country. This seminar aims to provide a forum for researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to share findings about the global impact of COVID-19 on demographics and policy implications for the uh, universal challenges we face today. We are all aware that uh, six countries or regions of our concern today are different in the geopolitical and socioeconomic setting. And there exists not only a time lag uh, in the spread of the pandemic and adoption of prevention policies, but also differences in the degrees of uh, demographic responses. It is great to have an opportunity today to learn lessons from the experience of other countries or regions and broaden our perspectives and insights. Today, we are going to have three sessions uh, with a lunch break and another break uh, between the sec second session and third session. And I would like to ask each speaker to uh, finish his or her presentation within 20 minutes. I uh, noticed that uh, some of you have prepared quite a large amount of materials for the presentation, but please bear in mind that each speaker uh, has a 20 minutes limitation. After three presentations in each session, 
two assigned discussions will have maximum seven minutes per person uh, for comment and questions, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, for those of you, those of the online participant who wish to make comment or ask questions, please use the chatting window function on your monitor. Then I'll be happy to read as many of the posted comments and questions on your behalf, or depending on time availability, I may call out your name during the Q&A session. For your information, this seminar is going to be videotaped and it will be uploaded on YouTube perhaps later this month or early next, uh, early November. Well, now why don't you proceed to the first session? As you see in the announcement of this seminar, Dr. Thomas Sobotka uh, appears as the first speaker of this session, but uh, due to misinformation on the uh, uh, new entry process at Incheon Airport, uh, his departure from Vietnam was delayed. We expect him to arrive at this seminar room around noon time today. So we have decided to reshuffle the today's program slightly. And Professor Bong Wo Ke from Kungmin University, he kindly agreed to serve as the first speaker of this session. He's one of the uh, most, he's very close to me, and he's one of the most active sociologists and demographers in Korea these days. And his research covers social stratification, inequality, and uh, major demographic issues. This morning, he's going to talk about excess uh, mortality after COVID-19 in Korea. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Pong Oh Ke. Now you have 20 minutes. I yeah, happen to be the first speaker, so due to some yeah, unexpected in your schedule, yeah, so, but it's my honor yeah, to be here to present my work uh, uh, to this audience. Uh, this study is uh, a part of the, the Kiasas uh, 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 project, annual project uh, uh, examining the impact of the COVID-19 on demographic behaviors. I'm uh, kind of analyzing some mortality data, so I'm going to share some of the key findings from that uh, project. Okay, this is the kind of outline of this talk. I'm going to briefly show some of the background, like uh, the COVID-19 spread in South Korea and the uh, Beijing mortality trend. And I'm going to show you some data and some basic method and share with you the results. This study is fairly descriptive. So I'm going to show a lot of figures and numbers, but uh, I may not be able to say something like why. So I'm going to sh show that how the, the mortality trend changes or uh, after COVID-19 um, <clears throat> outbreak. <clears throat> okay, so that graph shows that, so, so sorry for this uh, the, the Korean labeling, this is published by the Korean government that shows that the, the trend of the confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases, you can see that uh, until the 2000, Early 2022, there is some up and downs in the, the confirmed cases, but uh, the, the confirmed cases dramatically rose uh, during the early period of the 2022. So uh, compared, so given that the high rise, the uh, some kinds of COVID-19 spread until the, the end of the 2021, you no, know, looking back, that was not, something like not, nothing. So the very low, but so all, most of the COVID cases are confirmed in, uh, during the uh, early period of the 2022. <clears throat> so this is shows uh, the, the basic trend of the age specific mortality, weekly mortality rate of, uh, uh, since 2000, uh, 15, uh, 15. So you can see that 
uh, until the 2021, there was not much uh, rise in the mortality. So basically, mortality rates uh, for the young people, like uh, age 0 to 15, uh, go down, the tend to go down. And so some old age people's so mortality rates also uh, go down. But uh, the, as you can see the, in the last graph, the total graph, that's the entire population, that's kind of seems to uh, rising over time because of the population aging. But in early 2022, the mortality rate uh, is kind of spiked. So it rose a lot and uh, particularly like March and uh, April uh, in 2022. So that uh, kind of brings, brought some very critical mortality crisis in South Korea. <coughs> So in this study, I'm going to use the short-term mortality fluctuation data collected by Human Mortality Database that provides annualized weekly mortality rate data until the 30th week in 2022. And I'm going to kind of go analyze the five the different uh, age group. <laughs> in addition to the STMF, I'm going to use the, the Oxford Government Response Tracker to examine the relationship between uh, the government responses and the trend of the excess mortality rate that uh, data set uh, includes several measures of go government responses like uh, containment and closure, economic responses, and health system, uh, and GRI, that is a short, uh, the government response index uh, combining 16 uh, indices and that includes, for example, like uh, school closure and uh, banning the group uh, gathering or things like that. <clears throat> the data originally uh, collected in the daily, daily basis and I converted them to the weekly data to match the short-term mortality data, uh, short-term mortality fluctuation data. <clears throat> okay, so this study basically examined the excess mortality rate. Excess mortality rate is defined by uh, the difference between the observed mortality rate and the baseline mortality rate. And the key thing here is to define baseline mortality rate. In option number one, I assume that trend in uh, weekly mortality rate during the past five years, like uh, 2015 to 2019, continue during the COVID period. So I'm calling that is a linear model. And option number two is uh, the average uh, weekly mortality rate in the past five years continues uh, in uh, during the COVID period. <clears throat> And the cumulative excess mortality rate is just the sum of the excess mortality rate until the time t. And the final model is uh, to examine the, the relationship between cumulative excess mortality rate and the government responses. And according to the public health scholar, the key thing to kind of uh, respond to the, this kind of pandemic is the flattening the curve of the, uh, the mortality or the uh, confirmed cases. And so in so using that idea, so I'm going to examine how the level of the government response is related to the kind of curve of the excess mortality. So I'm using the kind of quadratic form of time specification and so interaction between these two. I'm going to show the result and you will find that uh, how this model is working. Okay, let me show you the basic findings. Okay, here, that is the baseline mortality rate uh, from the two different models. A uh, blue line is showed uh, from the linear model and red line is from the five year average model. So most, um, all age group, the five year average model estimates the uh, baseline mortality higher than the linear model because the linear model reflects the declining in the age specific mortality rate, but the five year average model doesn't. But in the total column, you can see that the linear model estimates the baseline mortality rate is higher than the five-year average model because of the population aging, the, the crude death rate is increasing over time. So that is for the men and uh, that is for the women. The basic trend is the same and the uh, uh, level is a little different. So if you have the, the, the 
free now. So you can, you can compare the y axis, the, the number is different. So men's so mortality rate is baseline mortality rate is uh, low, higher than the women's mortality rate, particularly for the old people. And so, so combining the observed rate and the baseline rate, we can get the excess mortality rate and so same pattern. So linear model tend to, uh, uh, excess mortality rate tend to be higher in linear model than five year average model. So you can see the trend. And for the youngest group, uh, we don't see any trend. And other groups, we see that there's no trend until the uh, 2022, but the, uh, uh, like, uh, March or April in 2022, the excess mortality rate is, uh, has been rising and then stabilized. And, uh, we don't see much difference. So, uh, and linear models, the excess mortality rate is higher because of the baseline is lower. And the same thing for the women's patterns. So you can see, yeah. So again, the pattern is similar, but the level is a bit lower for the women than the men. Okay, so let me show you the uh, cumulative excess, uh, excess mortality rate. Then maybe easier to see because of the a lot less fluctuation over time. So uh, for the youngest age group, the both mother estimate that the uh, uh, cumulative excess mortality is decreasing over time, particularly for the five year average mother. That means that the mortality rate to uh, during the 2020 and uh, 2022, early 2022 is uh, lower than the kind of average mortality rate between a uh, year to 2015 and uh, 2019. So that's uh, reflected in the lowest group and other groups. So it has been uh, uh, kind of close to zero. That means that there is no excess mortality rate until the, the, the beginning of the 2022, but uh, it increased uh, in the early period of 2022 for the linear model. And uh, the five-year average models are a little different stories, but so the pattern or uh, increasing pattern is kind of similar, up and down, so kind of similar. And that's the, so for the time constraint, I'm going to skip the women's pattern. Basically, uh, the, the, the pattern for the working age people are a little bit different, but other age group, the pattern itself is very pretty comparable. So let me sum up the, the result from the Korean data analysis. So in terms of the cumulative excess, or excess mortality rate, and then compare the 2019 mortality rate. So the column, the, the second column and third column shows that the cumulative excess mortality rate uh, in the time of the 30th week in 2022. And the third column, column number C, uh, shows the uh, 2019 mortality rate. And uh, the other, the last two columns shows the ratio between these two. So in the, in terms of total population, uh, total, uh, excess, uh, Excess, cumulative excess mortality rate uh, for the women, uh, men and women about uh, uh, a little less than thousand. Uh, I forgot to mention the units, so all the numbers are per uh, 100,000. So, so that means that so 40, uh, 80, 80, uh, 94, 94 men uh, died more than the usual of per or 100,000 when you use the linear or uh, the linear baseline and uh, for the women uh, for the the five year average mother there is the number is 191 so that number is kind of compared or uh, like uh, 15% or 30% for the 19 uh, 2019 mortality rate so that means it, it, because the uh I com computed the excess mortality rate until the 30th week uh, in 2021 to 22. That's kind of uh, like uh, two and a half years. So if we, so if we annualize this rate is about uh, six or 7% per year. So during the two and a half years, we see this uh, amount of excess mortality in South Korea. 
Let me show you some of the findings from the international comparison. Uh, the method is same, but in this, uh, the following slide, I'm going to show the, the results from the linear model, not for the five years uh, model. Uh, because I think that the linear model is more reasonable than the five year average model. Okay, so that's uh, the total population. So you can see that several countries, most countries, uh, excess mortality rate is pretty flat uh, around the zero. And uh, some countries like uh, Bulgaria, uh, Croatia, Czechoslovakia, and Latvia, Lithuania. So some of the Eastern European countries uh, have some kind of pretty high excess mortality rate. And for the young people, the, the age below 15, not, not much uh, uh, excess mortality, but even though some countries, there is a lot of fluctuation like Iceland and uh, Luxembourg, but basically trend is flattening, so that means that COVID-19 do not cause the, the young people. And the uh, working age people, the trends are different, and so same pattern, like uh, Eastern European countries has a lot of the excess mortality rate among the, the working age population. And the old people, it's the same pattern. So, uh, so, so as a result, the cumulative excess mortality rates are like that. So in Bulgaria, uh, the, the highest uh, cumulative excess mortality rate in Bulgaria, so that is about uh, a little less than 1,000 per 100,000 uh, in Bulgaria. So that is uh, about 1%. So during the COVID-19, uh, one out of 100 people uh, died uh, due to then or uh, died due to the changes in or uh, maybe related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's for the young, uh, young, uh, uh, children. So it's pretty low, most country except for Iceland. And that's for the working age people, uh, mostly low, but some of the countries like Bulgaria, like Lithuania and United States has a little high excess, cumulative excess mortality rate for the working age people. And this is uh, uh, old people, so the number is high. So there is the kind of comparison between the 2019 mortality rate to the ex uh, cumulative excess mortality rate. So you can see that in Bulgaria, like uh, about 60% more deaths occurred uh, during the COVID-19 period. So two and a half years, so like uh, more than 20% per year died. So that's a lot. And uh, but in Korea, like uh, this number is about 20%, so that is uh, like a 6 to 7%. So I don't know if it's high or low, yeah, so, but it, the, the number is like that. And uh, that's the young people, yeah, no trend. And so that's uh, the working age people. And uh, that's uh, 65 to 74. And so this is the old people. So clearly one thing, one pattern, you know, we can see that the kind of order of the, uh, the share of the cumulative mortality rate is kind of same for the, the entire population and the old people is pretty similar, but the young people, like uh, children and working age population, there's no uh, pattern uh, emerge. Okay, let me show you the final one. Okay, so. Okay, that's the, the trend of the government response measures, like uh, stringency, government responses, containment, and economic support. So, so it's kind of smoothed line, smoothed line. So it's kind of basic pattern is kind of couple linear. It's kind of rising and then uh, flattening. So most countries should follow this pattern. And that's the, the result from the uh, gross curve modeling. So we see that this kind of estimate, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of interaction terms. So we don't see, it's hard to read the, the, this table. So let me show you, uh, so the predicted values. So, uh, government in the response index is uh, vary from 40 to 70. Uh, actually, this from the, the data. So the maximum, minimum value is 37, I think, but then the maximum is 70, uh, 67, something like that. So we can see that, uh, the, the, the stronger government responses, the initially their rising of the cumulative excess rate is high, but their kind of rise, the pattern or uh, rate of change is lower. So that means that 
there is some interaction between the excess mortality and the government responses. So some of the countries have the, a lot of uh, 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 excess mortality, government acted. So they uh, implemented more stringent uh, measures. And then that may help to kind of reduce excess mortality. So their rate of the change is slower than those countries who do not uh, have very strong indices. But this is not the. Uh, it, it is not not easy to say some kind of causal way because so there is a lot of interaction between the the government responses and the pattern of mortality. So that's the uh, this one is total population. That's uh, so all this population that the pattern is basically same. Okay, let me wrap up. So in Korea, so we we, we already know that the low excess mortality until the spring of 2022 and rex rising, rising excess mortality in 2022 spring, and then uh, stabilize. So uh, we see that about 20% of cumulative excess mortality occurred until uh, 37th week into uh, 30th week in 2022, and international comparison shows that huge within country variations and high excess mortality in uh, Eastern European countries and the cumulative mortality rate and the uh, government responses are kind of related, and so that the uh, relationship between the deeper uh, levels and the growth rate. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for being punctual. Indeed, it is very difficult to uh, measure the uh, impact of COVID-19 on mortality across time because the reported number of uh, COVID-19 deaths toll is strongly affected by the uh, uh, testing capacity and reporting policy. Based on data from the human mortality database, I think Professor Ke conducted a superb job in estimating excess mortality during the pandemic. One minor comment that I have is about the tremendous number of subtractions and adding up uh, computations utilizing weekly mortality data by sex and age group. Uh, given that Deaths rate are extremely low for most of the age groups under uh, age 65. An issue of rounding errors as well as uh, data reliability can be raised in the process of calculating cumulative excess mortality rate. I would appreciate if you say a few words about it during the discussion session. Would that be okay? All right. Well. Now we move on to the uh, next presentation. Our next speaker is Professor Stuart Jitel Baston from Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Uh, yesterday I was told that he still maintains his affiliation with the uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. During the past 50 years, Stuart has been very active in the international circle, and he has keen research interest uh, in on population, changing population dynamics, as well as social policy in Hong Kong and Asian countries. The title of his presentation today is COVID-19 and Population Policies. Steve, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim. Um, thank you very much, Professor Lee and Dr. Chin for this very kind invitation and, uh, uh, Alice for being amazing and helping with getting everything, for getting me here. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and it's great to be here. Um, my talk is quite different. Uh, I don't have any graphs. I don't have any regressions. I don't even think I've got any numbers apart from years in publication. Um, the reason for this is I wanted to try to take more of a kind of an overview, right? To try to, try to look at what the literature is saying about, um, about COVID and population policy, not least because I think a lot of people are, are kind of scared, right? That, that we've had this, we see a lot of, of headlines like this, 
which uh, indicate that things are going from bad to worse in some ways, right? That there's that, that, that only really kind of negative uh, issues um, about um, population change. And what I want to try to uncover um, from the literature is that how can we learn from the COVID-19 experience? Now, this also doesn't assume that we are done with the COVID. I know President Biden has declared the pandemic over. Um, I think the fact that we're still wearing masks suggests that the pandemic is not yet over. Um, I know it's not over because you know, people are still catching COVID, right? People are still dying. Um, but w at this stage in the pandemic, even though we're not finished, what are some of the things that we can possibly learn and possibly take forward? And, and fundamentally, how can we try to turn this into a positive, right? How can we use it to help develop and deliver stronger population policies? Now, the first thing I would say is that, course, what do we mean by population policies, right? It, it's something which is thrown around a lot, and I think it can mean different things to different people. The way I think of population policy is not necessarily that, well, we have to have one, like fertility should be two, or uh, people should have more babies or fewer babies or whatever, or people should marry earlier. That's not how I think of a population policy. I, I mean policy, social and public policies that interact with demographic change. That's really how I'm thinking of, of population policy. I think that the first thing, um, and this I haven't put any literature in because this kind of it's difficult to, to find the literature on this, isn't it? Because it's too big, right? Is that I think the first problem that we have to address is this issue of a kind of COVID determinism, which is that everything that's happened in the last two or three years, we can automatically associate with COVID. Now, some things like excess mortality, by design, we can clearly associate with COVID. But there's other things which are going on, right? And when we think about uh, fertility change, about family change, COVID isn't the only thing that's been going on. But it's it's not. It's just when we look to take a longer time uh, frame of that, um, that around the world, you know, concerns about low fertility um, and explicitly pro-natalist policies in some parts of the world. Here in Korea, um, a transition at least towards more implicitly pro-natalist, but certainly more po uh, family-supported policies. Um, in recent years. So that major shift in Korean family policy, uh, which we've seen uh, in recent years as well. Um, and also these kind of uh, toxic narratives we've seen around the world, um, particularly with regard to... Um, oh, it's a little festival outside. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. as soon as I start talking about migration, the band plays outside. But So these kind of toxic narratives, particularly around migration, and of course, as I'll say in a minute, this is how these, really the theme I want to bring out is that COVID is exaggerating things which are already in place, right? COVID is exaggerating inequalities and challenges which are already in place, so particularly with regard to migration, but also with regard to fertility change as well, whether or not this is stigmatizing those uh, in low fertility countries who are not having enough children or remaining childless, or it's stigmatizing people who are having too many children, whether it's in differential fertility, we see this in India, obviously the most um, uh, uh, clear example, this whole idea of, a, of the growth of populism, of uh, this great replacement theory, these racist uh, notions around, uh, of, of around uh, demographic change. So, you know, these are things which we have to, we, we can't separate out um, uh, from uh, COVID change. Um, about the nature of work has become more fragile, when if we associate the nature of work with uh, family formation, with household formation, uh, again, COVID is just exaggerating this process of change um, in terms of um, the kind of concreteness of, of work. But then also, all of these things, plus COVID, plus other things, have happened in the last few years. In Hong Kong, it's the most obvious example, 
uh, of kind of social unrest, right? Um, in Thailand, there have been issues of, uh, of social unrest as well. And in fact, in a paper which actually, well, Polin told me to give this the other day, you know, that that the main uh, drop in fertility in, in Hong Kong is primarily based around the period of social unrest rather than COVID, right? It, it came around as a consequence of the events of 2019. Also, there is a war in the Ukraine as well. Um, um, there is a cost of living crisis, an inflation crisis uh, in many parts of the world. And yes, these are linked to COVID in some ways, but in many ways, of course, also uh, independent of that. So when I talk about uh, COVID as, as being something which is kind of exposed or uh, in a, a kind of exaggerated inequalities, um, the first theme, I've got basically uh, three kind of big themes, I would say. So the first theme is in terms of exposing fragilities in family systems. And so obviously the point of talking about this is that this can help us to think about designing better family policy. So clearly we can see that the gender division of care has been massively exposed through um, uh, through the COVID circumstances. And this is particularly through um, homeschooling as well, where women have uh, mothers have had disp massively disproportionately had to take on the responsibility for homeschooling, which therefore has had a very significant uh, knock-on effect for female uh, employment. Um, in terms of, um, to kind of stay with education in this theme of, of homeschooling, I think it's, um, obviously this is a very controversial thing to talk about, but education uh, was clearly subjugated to public health, um, that uh, you know, children were kept uh, out of school for, I think many would, uh, now on hindsight, we might say longer than necessary, particularly in Hong Kong, particularly in uh, parts of East Asia. Um, and this had uh, deleterious effects both on education for young people, but then this kind of circular effect upon uh, women's employment. And I think in that sense, the voice of younger people, the voice of even you know, younger people going into the biggest exams in their lives were clearly ignored, right? So there is a, 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 an issue here about where younger people and their, their wants and desires fit into this. Um, and, and, uh, and universities as well, you know, the university experience of younger people in this period of time and what they want is clearly going to be suboptimal uh, to what they, I would argue, they deserve. Um, issues around mental health, and again, particularly for younger people, uh, I think have been really exposed in the underfunding, the under support of mental health services um, around the world, um, not least with the suicides as well, and, and suicides among the young. As I mentioned already, the fragility of income and the rise in poverty, uh, it, it's no surprise that if you, if more and more of your uh, a labor market is in um, fragile employment, uh, is in, um, uh, in, in developed countries in, in fragile employment, but also in uh, middle income countries. If you're in the informal economy, it has really exposed, I think, the, um, the fragility of life in the informal uh, economy and therefore the link to poverty. And again, this is highly gendered. So the, 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 the primary impact particularly in the formal economy, when you're thinking about the burden of care is going to fall on uh, the shoulders of women. Um, migrant experiences, again, just highlighting the, the fragility of the migrant experience uh, in many parts of the world in terms of remittances, in terms of incomes, um, in terms of the reliance upon um, uh, of, of migrants, particularly as carers, again, uh, in Hong Kong, in many ways, like the care system shut down because it is primarily uh, based around uh, migrant care workers. And in, in that, that, as the borders closed, it became impossible to, um, uh, to replenish that system. And I, I think the argument there is of migrants being kind of left behind in this narrative as well. And so like uh, younger people, the voices of migrants tended to be uh, not so much heard. And finally, I think um, if we think of 
um, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, clearly in uh, particularly in middle and lower income countries, uh, access to reproductive health services uh, has been a challenge. Shows the fragility of those uh, of those services, um, but then also vulnerability to gender based violence as well. We've seen an increase in gender based violence um, in in both higher and middle income and lower income countries around the world, um, and. But there again, that's why we have to say, well, it's not just COVID, because COVID in, in some ways, uh, in some countries, this pushback against uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights in America, for example, right? In the Supreme Court, these are, this is not just related to COVID, right? This, this is a, a push, a narrative, which COVID is just kind of exaggerated um, and pushing uh, and pushing along. Um, I think in the same way that younger people's voices have been neglected somewhat, we have to uh, recognize the um, disproportionate impact upon um, uh, older populations. And I don't mean this only in terms of excess mortality, um, although clearly that is there, um, but in terms of, of how the vulnerabilities of older people have been uh, in contemporary society have been exposed. Uh, through COVID, in terms of accessing physical and digital infrastructure, um, in terms of uh, of, you know, uh, of having systems based primarily around these little pieces of uh, glass and metal and plastic that you could carry in your phone. Well, if you're not particularly adept at using one of these, you're going to have a problem, right? Getting around, and so that that digital divide uh, is is clearly uh, an issue. Um, this notion of of kind of compassionate ageism or care mongering, um, which you know is, a, is discussed a lot. This idea that uh, well, you know, older people are um, somehow you know need to be cared for and that they are incapable of looking after themselves, and we have to we have to do everything we can to support them. Now, on on, on the surface, you might think, well, that's that's what we should do, right? There's older people in our but it becomes it's just another stereotype. It presents older people as 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 being incapable right? of, of having less, uh, of not having the functions to be able to sort these things out. Um, and in some cases, of course, with the digital divide, it is a very real issue. But it becomes uh, again the stereotype of, of dependency. Um, and again, this has been linked to this idea of it being a kind of an, an older person's disease, right? When the, in the, the narrative, when it first came to Europe, with, it, with Italy, it was, oh my gosh, well, Italy is an old society, right? So then it's going to be a big problem um, in Italy. Um, whereas and, and in, in France, there's this headline is here, um, care home deaths due to COVID uh, were not even reported as such. Yeah. Um, so I have 20 minutes, right? I've got I'm 13 minutes and 49 seconds in. So, um, uh, as being uh, not even reported in, in France. And I think, again, it's due to this stereotype that older people, well, they were going to die anyway, right? And now they've died of COVID. But of course, we know that that's not the case. We know that when we look at years of life lost, right? Not just uh, excess mortality, but years of life lost. There are many, many. Um, um, uh, it's simply not the case right? uh, that life. You know, there has been a shortening of life expectancy, um, and this again is most, uh, I think, egregiously shown in triage decisions in hospitals as well. That older persons in some countries were deprioritized when it came to um, when it came to uh, their support in hospitals. Um, as demographers or people working in um, in population science, I think we can think of, we can consider these issues relating to data and measurement. Um, if, uh, if I, I, Thomas would have said, uh, and he will say this afternoon, that we have to consider the tempo effect, right? We have to, that it's not just that people have given up having children whatsoever in the last two years. They're just probably going to have them this year or next year, right? But uh, the headlines of this, uh, baby bust. Uh, are therefore exaggerated because we're not really presenting our information uh, accurately. Um, in many countries of the world, we've seen the cancelling or a postponement of the census, and I think it really exposes the. If you have a census every ten years, 
and something really big happens in the one year that you're going to have that sensor, then you've got a problem in collecting the census data, but then also the validity of that, of using that census data as a baseline for the next 10 years. Um, also, in terms of the ability to register births and issues of identity, if government facilities are shutting down, if you can't register your birth, you can't register a death, then how, what are the kind of the, the consequences of that? Um, this exact issue of, well, how many people die? And it's a simple question, but it's very, and there's a lot of arguments and we don't really know, right? It's very, it's very uh, challenging to do that. And I think that when we put all of this together, we uh, have a bit of an issue in terms of actually what is the narrative about this? And it allows both accidental misinformation, accidental reporting of what the impact uh, is, but then also, if you're so minded, deliberate misinformation, um, deliberate, um, uh, you know, when, I mean, your graph, so Russia, just stop it halfway through, right? And there's a reason for that, okay? And so it, it enables governments and other actors to be able to present their own particular view of this. And then in the absence of that information, it enables other people to present their kind of conspiracy theories as well. So, what are the big lessons then that we can draw? So, I can say that you know we could, of course, go through every single one and then design policy responses to each of these of these issues, and, is, and it's going to be different in different places, of course. But if we're going to kind of draw all this together, I would say that clearly these are inequalities which are driving negative outcomes, and COVID is exaggerating. Right? We could say that, and that's very clear. I think that we we really need. So I know we say this, we've been saying this for years, but we need to amplify the voices of children, younger people and older people in terms of policy formulation. And I know we've been saying this, but it really, I think COVID has made this very, very clear, the consequences of leaving some of these voices, uh, some of these voices behind. Um, data and measurements need to be brought up to the state of the art, um, you know, it is a simple fact that if we are relying on traveling around the country with a pen and a piece of paper to find out what's going on with people, this is very fragile because if something goes wrong and you can't travel around the country with a pen and a piece of paper, we've got a big problem if we're relying on that kind of, uh, on that kind of data. And I also think finally, it's a clear need for us in the population world to better communicate what is going on, right? To communicate possibilities and limitations. But I'm not, this is my last slide. You've got the microphone poised, ready, Professor. Um, I, I'm not 100% negative about this. I think that it is, there are some kind of positive green shoots which have come out of this, um, of this experience. And I think we could use these for a springboard for change. Again, we've always, you know, for years we've talked about civil society and how civil society uh, actors can, should become a, a more central uh, actor in terms of policy uh, change. And we've seen civil society coming through the fore and community action in many different parts of the world has been very, very strong and I think it needs to be nurtured. We now clearly recognize the digital divide unless it's being addressed as kind of new developments of this. We've seen a lot of evidence of intergenerational support uh, not this kind of compassionate agency, but a genuine inter intergenerational support in different parts of the world. We've seen um, um, government statistical agencies trying to respond to these challenges of, of collecting data and developing new kind of mixed methods approach in different parts of the world and, and, and using the kind of different survey with different data, big data, and seeing how that this can be uh, utilized. And then finally, although a lot of people complain about it, uh, this kind of COVIDization of research, that everybody is now writing papers on COVID uh, all of a sudden. Right? It's our new, like our new, our second job is to write articles on COVID. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of rubbish out there, which has just been, you know, quickly just thrown out. But on the other hand, it does enable, it does show that we can quickly just drop what we're doing if something really important comes along. And we can be more nimble, we can be more risk-taking to solve immediate uh, concerns. But it, it can be quite positive. There we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, you are very insightful review without presenting any tables or graphs and uh, sorting out 
the recent changes in population policy environment is very much appreciated. And I like your expression, COVIDization of research on the last slide. Uh, I agree with you about the proposition that COVID-19 tend to exaggerate negative outcomes of inequality on family and migrants. And it will be great if you elaborate this proposition a little further during the discussion session, okay? Now, why don't you proceed to the uh, third presentation now? Our next speaker is Mr. Hugo uh, Prosetio Putra. Forgive me my terrible pronunciation, but that's uh, all I can do at the moment. He is senior researcher at the National Research and Innovation Agency in Indonesia. And his research interests lie in health demography, health economics, and epidemiology. The title of his presentation this morning is Demographic Behavior in Developing Countries in the Wake of COVID-19 with the subtitle Insight from Indonesia. Please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Prasetya Putra. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Shin for um, for this event, it's and also Alice for very, for being very helpful throughout the uh, through the event. And uh, today, um, we I'm going to talk about demographic behavior. So, why is it important to talk about demographic behavior, and why is is it, is it really relevant in Indonesia? Uh, Indonesia is uh, the fourth most populated populated country in the world with um, more than two, 260 thousand, uh, million, um, million of population. So it's any kind of change and any uh, kind of um, events would uh, translate into a large number, a uh, child number. So today, uh, so this is just an overview. Uh, I'm going to talk about some um, background on the pandemic in Indonesia and the potential impact of uh, COVID and also uh, the demographic behaviors. So we all know that uh, the COVID um, had a de detrimental effect on all walks of life in, in all parts of the world. So in Indonesia, the first case was found in uh, early March 2020. And um, the dynamic was uh, very, it was a very dynamic uh, in terms of the ups and downs of the cases and the mortality. And we, we've we had uh, worse times. Uh, we we got second uh, highest in Southeast Asia uh, of the number of cases. Uh, and we had a couple of peaks, uh, as I will show in the later in, on in the graphs. And uh, when the vaccine uh, started roll, rolled out, uh, we, we've had some positive uh, um, numbers. But again, as we see that many factors into play, so we cannot uh, establish the causality. Yet. And there are uh, some um, papers, this one on by Jalante, um, that really uh, describes very well the national policies in the early stage of uh, COVID in Indonesia. So, so this is just to show uh, how, how the case number of cases throughout the, throughout the years. And we, as we can see that um, it's very fluctuating uh, in a way. And when the first vaccination, uh, when the vaccination has been rolled out, uh, the cases dropped uh, in uh, early 2021. However, when the Delta um, variant uh, kicked in, uh, we, we've had a surge in cases, almost to uh, more than 50,000 cases in July. And, and well, some uh, people might consider that uh, the holiday season is also uh, influencing the number of cases. Um, we, 
we we know that um, in Indonesia uh, there is a tradition of going back to hometown uh, before big holidays. This is uh, Idul Fitri, and many uh, even though the government has uh, enacted uh, many restriction policies, uh, there were loopholes in the um, system, and so the people can still uh, go back to their hometown during the holiday season. And uh, in the first, uh, in early January 2022, uh, the, the cases gone up again. Uh, very high, uh, it's much more high than the previous uh, peak. And also, but it was uh, it was a tragedy for Indonesia, but uh, now it, the cases has, has dropped significantly. And even though there is a, uh, a indication of a rise in the recent couple of weeks, uh, we we are not sure yet whether this uh, the trend will continue to increase or decrease. So there are potential impacts of uh, a COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, why I say potential, because uh, as Professor Gita Blaston said that uh, it's difficult to disentangle other effects. Uh, and yeah, as we know, the morbidity and mortality is very uh, obvious, but uh, also on the health, health system, Indonesian health system was already weak before the pandemic. And the COVID just uh, showed that uh, to the world that our system is very weak and exploited our health system. And the economy was also um, fragile with a uh, high percentage of informal jobs, uh, as Professor Gilbert and have mentioned before. Uh, many have lost their uh, jobs. Uh, it's the job insecurity is very high in Indonesia. And even though uh, uh, people may have uh, permanent jobs such as civil servants, uh, they could be also affected by uh, in terms of mental health. And also the food and uh, nutrition, uh, it may risk uh, uh, the stunting reduction efforts in Indonesia because uh, we all know that uh, one in three uh, under five children in Indonesia uh, ha has stunting. So it's stunted. So this is very... Um, very worrying uh, in terms of uh, human capital uh, implications uh, in the future. And also on top of that, uh, learning loss from uh, online education in Indonesia due to school closures, this would also uh, have an impact. And also there is some evidence of uh, stigmatization of uh, COVID uh, people who got COVID. Uh, like, neighbors would uh, would avoid them and even uh, they wouldn't be allowed to go to the health facilities in the in the early stage especially um, I even felt uh, the a similar uh, similar situation around in my neighborhood but uh, uh, it could it could have been worse in other neighborhoods so this is very so what uh, what are the five uh, demographic behaviors uh, that I that will talk? First is marriage, uh, and then fertility, and then um, divorce or separation, and then health seeking behavior, and migration and mobility. So uh, when Dr. Shin sent uh, an invitation uh, of uh, this event, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, we. My research institute uh, hasn't done any research uh, on um, demographic behavior, but then I thought uh, we did some research about uh, focusing on family resilience uh, survey in 2021, but we did not look, have a look at uh, demographic behaviors uh, in particular. So I thought that we, uh, I discussed this with my team and we did a re review of literature uh, uh, specific to Indonesia. So first, marriage. Uh, the data on uh, national marriage is very, very difficult to obtain. Uh, the, this is because the civil uh, registration and battle statistics in Indonesia is uh, quite, uh, it's many to be improved. 
uh, but there are evidence that child marriage uh, has risen in Indonesia. Uh, and this is uh, even mentioned in the world that the, the cousins have mentioned that the risk of uh, more than 2 million children worldwide and uh, the pandemic could, uh, could be attributable to that. So in Indonesia, uh, the, the, fortunately, there are some studies that uh, looked into this, but however, the, the result is very unfortunate. It's very sad to see uh, that uh, the, so to put into context, uh, in Indonesia, the age of uh, minimum, minimum age for marriage has been increased to 18, but uh, they still allowed for uh, application of dispensation. Uh, so, they, the researcher Julianto and colleagues approached uh, by looking at the number of dispensation and it had increased uh, during the pandemic. So, almost uh, more than doubled. So, this is uh, worrying. This is just in the. Uh, uh, and then uh, the next research is by Rahim, uh, and this is uh, specific to West Nusa Tenggara. Uh, it's one of the provinces in, in Indonesia, and they they also found an increase in uh, this request for dispensation of underage marriages. So, and they they further um, did qualitative uh, interviews, and they found they found out that there are several reasons of being married as and the pandemic conditions, uh, the lockdowns and and the restrictions cause. Uh, cause the students, the young age population to be, to get bored. And marriage is sort of like an escape route, uh, route to, uh, from the, these conditions. And also there are uh, a local tradition, uh, but um, some research say that this may be associated with uh, the increase in uh, uh, the problem of child marriage. It's called uh, Mararic when when a young child, uh, a young female and male uh, is uh, uh, gets together like dates and uh, and someone find out that, and they will have to get married uh, soon after that because uh, it's a uh, it's uh, it's bad for social um, socially uh, unacceptable for them to be together uh, and not married. But uh, throughout the years, uh, the young population uh, have taken advantage of this uh, tradition. It's it's supposed to be uh, good, uh, purpose has good purpose, but the young uh, intentionally get together uh, so that they will they will sort of like force their parents to uh, to marry them. So this is uh, this is very worrying. Many NGOs have worked throughout the last decades to fix this, and hopefully uh, they will be better in the future. And the next one is fertility. Uh, in in the early stages of COVID, uh, there there were many uh, there were many issues uh, s sounded by the media that uh, whether the there will be uh, birth uh, a boom in births uh, and this is because uh, there were 10 percent drop in the um, CPR in Indonesia in the early into 2020 and it could uh, lead to and coupled with uh, more time in the home uh, and increased sexual activities it could lead to a uh, increase in births uh, however the there could uh, there be other factors that could uh, as contract this uh, effect. One is uh, by Kusuma, he found that mental health effects of pandemic uh, could decrease mood in uh, doing, um, in having more children or in doing sexual activities. And use of short, short term uh, contraceptive methods may, uh, may be used uh, as a way to uh, delay having children or to prevent having children. And also uh, uncertainty about the future. Having a, a, a kid is not, uh, is not 
cheap in a way. It, it requires uh, a lot of resources. And uh, given that the uh, economic impact of COVID on uh, Indonesia, this might uh, counter the the fertility increase hypothesis. Uh, and the next one is by Alpana. It, this is just to show that uh, uh, we some researchers try to uh, use um, statistical method to forecast to predict an increase in the fertility, and they did find an increase. However, this uh, they did not uh, consider social and um, social conditions and and economic conditions of uh, the area. So this is. Uh, and then, uh, so even though the prediction uh, did uh, increase, but the the in two thousand and one, the National Population and Family Planning Agency conducted a family data collection. So they, they did not find an increase. Uh, it uh, it actually fell, uh, and then. So in terms of uh, divorce, uh, one study found an increased uh, divorce cases uh, from 2018 and to 2021 in West Java province. And the most common re reason is uh, has changed. Uh, now it's uh, marital conflicts. This is, uh, they, they explained that this is probably due to economic pressure during uh, COVID during the pandemic. And the other uh, demographic behavior is this childhood immunization. Uh, and there are evidence of uh, delayed uh, child delay of children's compulsory vaccination uh, due to the pandemic and due to closures of uh, uh, the health facilities and also the increased workload pressure on the healthcare facilities because they focus more on uh, the COVID vaccination of COVID and also the patients. And also uh, the the restrictions also affected uh, healthcare utilization uh, of uh, other diseases such as uh, NCDs, such as cancers and diabetes, and this could lead to uh, uh, increased health burden in the future. In terms of migration and mobility, uh, there were evidence, uh, although minor, uh, of returning to from urban to rural areas. Uh, this is actually is in terms of low skilled labor because they they lost jobs, lost their jobs in the rural the in the urban areas. And also the immigrant were the Indonesian migrant workers overseas uh, was had difficulties of returning uh, in Indonesia. And the the next one is uh, there's a mudik phenomenon. So I mentioned this earlier, and it, the pandemic uh, said that uh, some a survey during the pandemic uh, revealed that uh, forty percent uh, would still go home even though uh, the government puts restriction. So this might have a potential implication on the cases, number of cases, the spread of uh, cases throughout the region, and this is just to show. Uh, this is from a study by Pramana, just to show that uh, the effect of uh, working from home uh, activities uh, from the pandemic, from the restrictions. So to conclude, uh, there are um, any evidence that show changes in demographic behaviors that could be attributable to the COVID pandemic. However, uh, most of them are locally specific and we need a more robust um, evidence on the national level. And uh, the use of uh, digital methods, especially uh, online surveys were uh, prevalent uh, during the times. However, they have, they, uh, some of them considered of small, a very small number of sample. And this could be a problem for representativeness. So, and the last one is, uh, the need for increasing, uh, improving the CRVS system so that uh, the next, we, we can really get, uh, track uh, demographic events such as births and mortality uh, better in the future. So that's all my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Pugo. Uh
for your excellent presentation, which helped us in great deal to understand the demographic situation in Indonesia throughout the pandemic period. And it is interesting to learn that the COVID-19 has facilitated the child marriage the last past two or three years. And uh, could you explain a little bit more about it during the discussion period? And it will also be great if you say something, a few words about the uh, general trends in the in the mean age and marriage in Indonesia or similar indicators, right? Okay. 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 Uh, as you can see in the program, we have two discussions uh, in this session, and I would like to invite Dr. Sugi Che first for comment and uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Che is Associate Professor at the uh, KDA School of Public Policy and Management. Dr. Che, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presenters. Uh, it was very interesting to see all of you. And though we are living in the situation of the COVID-19 last more than two years, so definitely we, there will be some huge impact from COVID-19. Uh, I also find a very interesting keyword from the, the, the digital Boston presentations. He says there is some unrest and pressures and even toxics. But he also suggests some positive shift. So I think that even with these changes, we can find something positive or some a more active policy to, to fight against COVID-19. And the pool, the, at the pool's presentations, I also found that the, the problems we are experiencing is actually, some of them are actually the ongoing challenges. It began even before the COVID-19. This example of child marriage issues was happened before the COVID-19, but it was exacerbated during the COVID-19. So when we understand the issues of COVID-19, I think I agree that it is very important to understand the relationship between COVID-19 and ongoing issues. And the, in the case of the, the professor case, the presentations, the, I think that we know that the many countries are experiencing the, the, the change of the life expectancy, the, it was shortened, and this kind of the changes was very, Specials, we are usually experience some elongated of the life expectancy in human histories. Uh, it shows that there is some the excessive mortality in South Korea, but uh, he also shows that before the the, the recent the, the increase of the the mortalities, before that there is shows some I can say is. Negative excessive mortalities or some uh, deficient uh, the the mortalities. There is some years or sometimes it shows that there is some negative values. It means that in South Korea enjoyed or some even fewer the the deaths during the COVID nineteen. So I'm very curious what will be the, the life expectancy in South Korea. And it, all this the presentation shows that the the, the the test, the COVID-19 makes is very complicated in many fields. And sometimes we can show some chances to, to fight against it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now turn to the second discussion. Dr. Tan Po Lin, she is Associate Professor at the Ligonier School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. Dr. Chen, Tan. 10 or 10, I'm sorry, 10. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, um, uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, my um, my thanks again to uh, Professor Lee, Professor Kim, and Dr. Shin for bringing us together here in this se for this seminar. And um, and this morning's um, 
presentations on uh, demographic implications of uh, COVID-19 have been um, very interesting um, and eye-opening. I'm um, very grateful that we have been here. Um, I think that all the three presenters had a lot to say that were highly policy relevant, um, whether looking at uh, the impact of government responses on mortality or looking at um, an overview of uh, implications um, of, um, of uh, what uh, looking looking forward policy should look like and also looking at how uh, the responses in Indonesia um, have um, uh, you know the, 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 the very uh, context specific um, issues in, in Indonesia and uh, giving us a very good sense of the contextual issues. So uh, I actually uh, have a few questions and remarks and uh, I'll be sure to keep track of the seven minutes but uh, for the first uh, presentation on mortality uh, pro uh, pro um, that's presented by um, Professor Kia. Uh, I just had a question um, about uh, a, perhaps a question to start with, uh, asking about the government response in the index. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is, um, for, does vaccination come into it? Because uh, vaccination obviously would have been a big part of how governments uh, manage mortality. So that would be one thing. I, I am thinking not, uh, but a description. Um, and that would be something that um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on. The other thing that I wanted to say was regarding um, just looking at this very, very well uh, laid out table that uh, we kind of just went over quickly because of time um, and looking at the coefficient for GRI, which I understand to be kind of the, you know, the independent indicator of interest. Um, when I look at it, I see that it's, um, it's a positive number. And I'm in, am I interpreting it correctly to say that that means that the higher the the higher the not the higher the indexed, the higher the assess mortality, and um, if that, that does that mean that a higher index means that there's more restrictions? Um, oh, I wasn't sure if I fully uh, understood it. Um, and finally, just looking at the model, the econometric model, uh, I saw that you had um, a great deal of controls that were. Uh, for time trends and time trends uh, interacted with GRI. And I, I, I guess uh, just a very quick um, uh, question on what you think about the possibility of interacting with, with country uh, instead, um, and also uh, considering country fixed effects. Uh, so that's very just a very technical uh, uh, comment because it is a very well done technical paper. Um, addressing. Um, Prof. Uh, Getel uh, uh, Bastin's uh, presentation, sorry. Um, and um, I have some comments which were on the slides. If I could, uh, if I could have the, the slide turn to that, thank you. Um, so uh, it was uh, very insightful, as um, Prof. Kim had mentioned, uh, look at, you know, a general overview of um, how um, how things have changed um, and looking not just um, I think on the surface but really under the surface. Uh, I think the, your presentation when you talked about the exposure of different groups of vulnerable people, um, you mentioned different groups, women, youth, elderly, low-income, migrant groups um, and obvi obviously uh, they had faced different challenges um, which required different solutions uh, and that's what you laid out. But um, may I also be so bold as to venture to mention that uh, not only were the vulnerabilities of different groups exposed, but in fact, the vulnerabilities of public systems and governments uh, fallible were also exposed. So during COVID-19, as you mentioned, you know, everything was attributed to COVID. And um, because it was considered a public emergency, Governments, uh, in many cases, overstepped their traditional boundaries. Uh, they enacted policies that uh, otherwise would have been unacceptable to the public. So this is uh, at once an opportunity for, um, for there to be greater uh, building of trust and cohesion. And this is what we saw in Singapore actually with, uh, with crisis like SARS, or it could lead to social fragmentation. 
uh, distrust and the feeling that the government is getting re uh, governments around the world getting more authoritarian. Um, so this is such just something that I wanted to uh, quickly highlight. Beyond these groups that you've mentioned, I'd also like to say that uh, there's actually been a backlash as well against uh, specifically East Asians in the global West. And um, this has actually a lot of implications for geopolitics. And um, uh, finally, um, I wanted to mention, uh, uh, I agree with you about silver linings. And to add on to the list that you've mentioned, uh, that I think that uh, the movement toward telecommuting could also mean that work and participation in the labor force could become more inclusive. Um, and that um, the second point I wanted to make with that exposure of precarities towards more sustainable system uh, simply means that we're not going back to normal, but maybe that's not such a bad thing. Uh, we're going towards something new. And um, so instead of having, um, for example, women trying to balance work and life and in a very precarious balance, um, in fact, we could be moving towards something that is more um, more sustainable and more robust to crisis. But uh, thank you very much. Just a very um, short remark. Um, sorry, can I move on to the last one? I think I'm probably in over seven minutes, but if I may. Um, to just to uh, address uh, Professor um, Prasad Yopatputra's uh, very nice presentation. Um, so I was uh, quite struck uh, by a couple of things in your overview. So you mentioned the increase in um, divorces and child marriage, and that was very heartbreaking and very eye-opening. Um, I wanted to just uh, mention um, uh, with regard to the the, the fact that there was no large difference in birth counts, um, that, that could be a very serious divergence along the socioeconomic line that covers up this seemingly lack of a trend. So we could be seeing a large increase among um, the lower income groups and a large decrease among the high income group. And, you know, together, you don't see that. Um, so uh, that's one thing I wanted to mention. And um, maybe to wrap up, because I think I'm uh, over over extending my, my time here, is uh, um, to say that the context of Indonesia is also very interesting from a policy perspective, because Indonesia took a very unique stance of vaccinating workers before the elderly. Uh, as a decision to first protect the economy. And um, I wonder if you're in the response, you could mention what you think about that uh, as uh, um, what do you think about that and the, and the consequences for demographic change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could save time. Uh, I'll take a few more questions and comments from the participant. And then after then, I'll ask each speaker to put them together and wrap up uh, his response. And perhaps, uh, Professor Om, you might wish to make some comment or questions to the presentation made by Professor K. Is that right? Yeah. Actually, you were supposed to make some comment uh, on his presentation anyway, so I'll let you have a chance to speak. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to give a very short comment. And I'd like to give a very short question about the GRI indexes. So many countries thought from how we can respond to the COVID-19 pandemic as a problem, but the strategy was very different according to the country. For example, Korea and Japan do not have some kinds of mandatory lockdown, just a recast or the other country did a lot of, instead of that, the Korea and Japan did a different strategy. So I, I wonder which factor, if, if possible, is it possible to, because the GRI consists of the 17 indexes, is the combined indexes. So if we can the check the individual impact, so it may be a very helpful to find out what should we do for the post pandemic or the second pandemic. Then, and then in your models, because I'm not, I cannot fully really understand your model. So the interesting is that just GRI do not, does not significant in your model. Just GRI was not significant in your model, but 
the interaction term with the time was significant. I think this is just my interpretation that it may be a, we need time to show the effect of the responses. So if, but it can differ according to the strategy. Some strategies can show the, in the result immediately, such as lockdown. Or sometimes the remote work or changing our life make time to change our lifestyle. In that case, the time is very critical point. So if possible, so for our future post pandemic, if you have some opinion, because you said that it's just a start point to know the reason why the result, but I hope if you have some possible reason for that, I'd, I'd like to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, at the moment, I do not see any questions or comments appears on my monitor. Uh, any questions or comments from the participant? I can take, I think they got enough number of comments and questions, but still I can take one more if you, none? Okay, then why don't I ask each speaker to respond to the questions and comments? Uh, I think it's better to ask the first speaker go first, okay? You got too many questions, comments, yeah. but I'm sure you can manage. Mm -hmm. And I would appreciate uh, if you make your response not too long. Yes, yeah, I'll be, I'll be very grateful because uh, the, your suggestion is all right. So, yeah, so, so let me talk of first about the rounding of errors. So, so that is related to the data issues. So I'm using the the ST, yeah, the human, uh, short term fluctuation data. Uh, the thing I can do is I just trust them. Yeah. So the human, human motor data, but they are, I think they are most rigorous, uh, group, uh, rigorous group of researchers. So, uh, I cannot do anything about the data, but your suggestion is, uh, valid because of very, we are handling very small numbers. So rounding of error may, uh, or distort our result. But I think that if we look at the, the cumulative excess mortality rate that is accumulated and so the number is a little high, a bit higher. So I, I think that the number of the cumulative excess, excess mortality rate is pretty stable. So that the, it may not be affected by these kind of errors. So that's what I can think. And the second question by the Professor Suki Cho, e, Cho e is the, the implication for the life expectancy. I know that uh, in 2020, the life expectancy in Korea doesn't drop and it increased. So in kind, kind of usually a little less than, I think uh, in most years, the uh, life expectancy increased by like a uh, 0.3 years per year, something like that. But yeah. I, if I remember correctly, the, the, the 2019 and 2020, 20s, like, uh, changes in life expectancy is about 0.2 years, something. So we cannot say, uh, for now, I can't say anything about the, the expectation of this. And 2021, uh, I, yeah, we, I may expect that similar trend is going on, but 2022, I'm sure that the life expectancy will drop. So maybe the, the first time in Korean, the, maybe the recent, uh, the modern history. And the uh, professor Tan's and the arms question is about all the, the, the last one. I should have not included that slide. <laughs> yeah, so, and so basically that's very not easy one. So uh, we know that the, the, Excess mortality happen and the government react. So, the, in, but in my mother, I assume that government responds kind of uh, or moderates the the excess effect the excess mortality rate. But it, so, if we run some simple model that we can see the positive correlation between the the government uh, response uh, index and the uh, excess mortality because uh, government react more rigorously because they have more mortality. So, so to handle these issues, I was intentionally very kind of descriptive. So I all combined all 
the, there are a lot of information, time bearing information about the GRI, but I didn't include them. I just kind of average them. So this country has a higher level of government response and this country is low. So then I kind of plotting the, their, the cumulative excess mortality curve and so, and the regression result kind of basically summarize these, uh, the gross patterns. So I don't think the, the each coefficient is not uh, interpretable. Yeah. So because in the model, there are a lot of interactions. So the main effect does not have any so significant implications. So the thing I the, the graph shows that the, the predicted value may be helpful, but still this model is, has this kind of uh, drawback. So I'm, I'm still thinking about what is the best way. And so for the question for the GRI, it's so a vaccination. The GRI index does not include the vaccination, uh, in the particular measures. They all, uh, the Oxford measure also include the vaccination measure, but, but they did not include them in the, the composite measure. I guess that not every country is in the data set has the information about the vaccination that, that, and GRI index uh, can exclude the vaccination. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart, you're the next. Well, thanks very much. Um, I think really the main, um, well, so I, I, it's kind of just agreeing with everybody, but I, I'll just, um, the, the, the three points, which I think just to respond to Professor Tan here. Um, I think that the, yeah, this issue on the, on governments and, and the vulnerability of government. And, and again, I, I think that, that point is very well made and well taken. And, and again, it's linked to, but it's linked to kind of these prevailing processes as well. Um, in certainly not would have been acceptable in 2018, probably wouldn't have been acceptable in 2019, but then with a mix of COVID and national security law, obviously then that presents a whole new, you know, there is a, you know, there is a reason why the rules were that you can only have four people meeting outside, but you can have 200 people meeting inside. So you have these counterintuitive public health regulations, which don't make any sense, right? Why can you have more people inside than outside? It doesn't make sense. Well, people don't have demonstrations inside, right? This is, this is clear, right? So, it was, so this is how governments do it. But there are also, again, to take another example from the UK, that you know, to have a, a right-wing conservative government, which is spending enormous amounts of money on furlough um, and, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't necessarily make sense. You would you would not expect a conservative government to do that. But that was again part of this trend towards the Johnson populist era of spending money and going against those kind of conservative principles. So again, the the, the pandemic enabled that. As we saw last week, though, you can only go so far of spending money and not taxing. And then that's what happened. The government collapsed. But anyway, we have a new prime minister today, so that's there may be another new one by the end of this, uh, the, the end of this seminar. I don't know. Um, but I would say the last thing. But, in, but again, I think that, that's why civil society. That's why it's not just government. So that's why I think civil society again played that key role in interme as an intermediary factor between government and, and, and individuals. Um, on um, the backlash against Asians. Um, Again, I think that, yeah, I mean, of course, I, I, that's undeniable. Um, but, um, in the con, in, in a broader context of Mr., you know, if we're thinking about the United States, for example, there was, you know, a, a race, you know, well, there's always been racism. I'm inclined to say there's always been, uh, intense racism against uh, Asians in the United States. And Mr. Trump and his, uh, own ideologies and economic, uh, I say economic policy, it's not really a policy, the economic prejudices, um, enabled this. And, and you know, and so this, this anti-Asian, anti-Chinese view was, was in place before COVID. So COVID just enabled this. It was, exa is, is again, exaggerating this, right? Enabled this to be, to be legitimized almost, right? Enabled this to be, um, uh, sent out loud. Um, and then finally, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it, this issue of, of telecommuting, more flexible work, work can be more inclusive. Yes, it can. Um, and again, to be optimistic, I would say this is a wonderful thing, but one can also be pessimistic that it can increase inequalities, right? That it can increase the fragility of work. It can, uh, and that's what uh, Professor Kim's question about, about 
uh, about these inequalities in the family, right? That um, if you're, if we're moving towards this atomization of work, this, uh, this notion of, um, of, of, a, of a very, very fragile workforce where you don't even have a, a desk anymore. You don't even have, a, it's so easy to just, you know, you have people who are at home. That's it. We just expect them to be tuning in all the time. It also has consequences for your, for our work patterns as well. Um, I don't know about you. I'm now expected to be at meetings in the middle of the night because we can do this on the, the, the telephone, right? Uh, I'm expected to be on call 24 hours a day because we're now in this, because work has become digitalized. So there are downsides of that, uh, I would say as well. But I will be positive and say, yes, there are definitely upsides. Done. Well. Okay, thank you, Stuart. For your information, uh, Dr. Tan used to work, before joining the NUS, she used to work as a population policy officer at the Prime Minister's office. That's why she has all the questions about the government law. Well, uh, next is Pugo. Are you ready? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, okay, I would like to address um, the comments from the discussant. Uh, and but before that, I would like to uh, respond to Professor Kim's uh, suggestion uh, about uh, child marriage. Uh, indeed, this was already a problem uh, way before uh, way before the pandemic. And as we we can see from uh, the uh, demographic uh, numbers, the the age, the mean age at first marriage uh, had increased from 19.3 uh, to 22.4 over the last couple of decades. But it's such a small increase and the figure is much slower than uh, more developed countries such as Japan, uh, almost 30 and even South Korea, 31. So. This, even though there there have been an increase in main, uh, mean age at ma first marriage in Indonesia, but oh, 34, okay. So we're still very uh, left behind. So even though there are efforts to increase the the uh, to put on regulation to put to increase the minimum age of marriage, the the numbers still show very low, and. That's one one issue. But another issue is the provincial variation in uh, mean age at first marriage, and some provinces have very low uh, age uh, mean age of marriage, such as Kalimantan. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, some has uh, very high. Uh, for for example, Aceh, uh, which is very conservative uh, in a sense. Uh, has uh, managed to increase their uh, their uh, mean age uh, at first marriage. So, so uh, I can say that there is a potential uh, uh, relationship with uh, religion sentiment. Uh, as we know that uh, Indonesia is uh, uh, dominated uh, by Muslims. Uh, however, I cannot say more because uh, I'm not an expert on um, religion issues. But but uh, I can say that uh, the the Islam uh, recommends uh, marriage, early marriage, if uh, the couples are ready. So uh, to prevent uh, uh, them from having uh, premarital sex. So, however, uh, the, there are many interpretation to this, uh, the readiness of uh, the couple. So. Uh, this is subject to be discussed uh, in, in other uh, events. So it's very interesting to, to look at the social and religious aspect of child marriage. And I would like to continue to, uh, to, to Professor Choi. Uh, indeed, yes, uh, the, the problems I've uh, spoke about uh, in the presentation was mostly already been uh, uh, an issue in Indonesia, and it's got uh, exas exacerbated uh, during the pandemic. And and uh, I think the government should uh, should 
learn from that, uh, not to uh, not to be lenient and not to be um, careless about uh, many aspects of uh, economy and health. Uh, especially, uh, there there is still uh, a possible future pandemics uh, in front of us. So the government should should not be um, should prepare for that. And to respond to uh, Professor Tan, uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, so, uh, sometimes uh, the average can deceive uh, us. Yeah, the, the average numbers of uh, can deceive us uh, when the variation, uh, when some events or some uh, issues vary by income income groups, and this is uh, this this requires uh, further research uh, in terms of uh, demographic uh, behaviors in Indonesia, I, and this is an opportunity actually to uh, for us to uh, do more uh, robust research in the future and uh, hopefully this uh, my talk will spark uh, interest uh, not only from uh, Indonesian researchers but also from other Asian uh, research and about the vaccination policy this is quite sensitive actually uh, but if I may uh, uh, well there, there were mixed uh, mix uh, arguments regarding uh, who to be whom to be vaccinated first uh, the workers or the the health workers or the young age workers and all the elderlies but one argument uh, that supports uh, choosing the young workers uh, first was uh, that the elderlies as uh, are presumably in, staying at home most of the time uh, because uh, most of them are retired, but I don't have a number on uh, figure for this, and and that's the the argument. And then uh, another uh, issue is that the uh, the type of vaccine that you was used in the early uh, stage was Sinovac, which had more uh, um, possible uh, side effects when. Uh, uh, when it's administered to ed the elderly, so they 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 are afraid that if we perform this on the elderly, that there could be uh, adverse effects and mortality. So that's one of the reasons that another reason that they chose to vaccinate uh, young people. And as we know that uh, Indonesia's in population structure is uh, young, quite young. Uh, so that's also they argue that uh, um, that it is uh, more urgent to save the many lives. Uh, but but by no means I don't. Uh, I'm saying this uh, doesn't mean that we should sacrifice the elderly. No, uh, but but uh, they had to make a choice, uh, and I think that uh, it is based on. Uh, uh, pretty good evidence uh, at that time. However, uh, uh, along with Sinovac, uh, they have also uh, procured other types of uh, vaccines, such as Pfizer and um, other types of. Uh, with, uh, and then they had uh, they continue vaccinating the elderly. So I think. Uh, that, that was uh, their decision. So, yeah, based on uh, the, the data that they have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am very much relieved that Thomas arrived on time. Okay. Uh, we are a little bit behind the schedule unless he has any objection or unless we have uh, 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 any burning questions or comment, we are going to have a lunch break. Uh, it's not that e usual or easy for the um, Kihaza president to, to stay uh, with us during the whole morning session. I'm very much grateful for that. Three speakers to discuss and then all the uh, uh, participants. Uh, I'm really grateful for your uh, participation and contribution. Uh, 
Uh, do you have any announcement to make or instructions from your? Okay, why don't you go ahead first? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the insightful presentations and discussions. Just a quick notice: we'll be back by two p.m. for the offline and online um, participants. So I hope you all enjoy your lunch and be back by two p.m. Thank you. Okay, I don't need to repeat, but please make sure to return to this room by two p.m. today. Would that be okay, Thomas? All right. Uh, now uh, we've listened to all the you know excellent presentations, comments, and everything. Now I'm very happy to announce that the first session is closed. Okay, enjoy your lunch, and uh, you need to get refreshed. You know. We have two hours for lunch break, so you can take a use. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all.